Well, hello, hello. Welcome to Jazz After Dark. How are we doing today? Tonight? Hope everybody's doing good. We're going to talk about brokerage accounts for beginners here. And maybe, you know, maybe there'd be something to learn for uh, some of you others out there that are not so familiar with the rules. Um, and I have a feeling we could expand on this a little bit. So you'll let me know in the comments below. As always, we've got our sample here tonight. If you're having a drink with me. If not, skip ahead, but, uh, you know, something, right? We have a 15-year-old single malt scotch whiskey. It is called Glen Alachi. I, I butchered that. I know I did. Uh, it's from Flaviar. Again, we've got one more to go here in our little five-pack. Uh, there's a link in the description if you want to support the channel and, and uh, let us have some free drinks. Uh, they give you a discount for doing that. So be sure to check that out. Uh, the Glen Alachi. I don't, it's, uh, I don't know how you say that, but I assume that's it. Maybe Cody can put up a, a image of the bottle or whatever. Uh, it is primarily notes of raisin, dates. Oh my God, this is going to be good. Uh, banana, ginger, butterscotch, orange peel, walnut. Okay. Yeah. A lot of sweetness, uh, which is interesting. A uh, lot of raisin in the smell there. that's a scotch whiskey right there i'm not a scotch guy so much so that initial hit of the scotch there you know it's um kind of kind of turns me off a little bit it's very good uh, i'll give you that um i don't have much to compare it to but if i had to drink a scotch whiskey i'd be very impressed with this um i don't know what it costs you should look these things up right we should talk about that i might be drinking something that's cheap the glen Alachi, it's the 15 year old single malt scotch whiskey. What does this thing run here? What? Whoa. Like a hundred bucks? Yeah, the 12 year old goes for $77.99. Holy cow. Uh, I looked up the Yellowstone from last night. That was like 40 bucks. Uh, wow. <clears throat> Yeah, 95 bucks. Uh, you could do, well, you, you can find it here for it looks like 70, 89. Whoa. Uh, well, I'm glad I didn't look at that before I drank it, you know, because then I'd be like, oh, this is great. Uh, it's good. It's not great, but it's good and it's very sweet. I do really appreciate the, uh, the sort of fruit. I wouldn't have guessed raisin or banana. But it's good. Uh, give you that one there. So there you go. Uh, got a free shot there of a $100 uh, scotch whiskey. Oh, I feel fancy now. Uh, if you want to, you could do the same thing actually in uh, Flaviar. Uh, monthly subscription that we have here. Me and Charlie just did it and then they found us and they said, well, you know, we'll give you guys a discount. And uh, I think they're going to send us some free stuff too. So if you sign up, you know, use that link. <laughs> Anyways. Okay, that's getting, the longer you let it sit there, the more that, the, the less the scotchy, kind of that original scotch flavor goes away, the more you start getting all kinds of sweetness and different. I mean, it's just all over the place. I Again, I wouldn't have guessed raisin, but I would say fruits and maybe even florally fruits in a way. Very good. All right, enough of that. You guys ready to get started? For beginners, brokerage accounts, extremely popular right now because people realize the stock market is discounted and they want to get back into it. I understand that. I applaud that. But there's some things you need to know. We're going to start with the basics here tonight. If you're one of our clients, we've actually just did a recent class on some of the more advanced topics that revolve around brokerage accounts. And of course, we have in the past, we've talked about everything you can use in brokerage accounts all the way up to you know, portfolio margin, using options and different uh, strategies there. So uh, that would be in the dojo. If you're one of our clients, you just go to that section there, classes and research, and you can check it out. <clears throat> The first thing I would like to point out for you today is that in a brokerage account, you're putting in dollars that have already been taxed, All right? All right. So if you make a profit only when you realize the gains, meaning you bought stock XYZ, it went in your favor and you had a profit. So you sold it when you sell you owe taxes in the year that you sell. 
Contrary to that, if you bought stock XYZ, you have a profit, but you cho to, just chose to sit back and watch it. You did not actually realize the sale. So your two key terms there are realized, the physical act of taking the profit, and unrealized. Think of your house. If you bought a house and it appreciates in value, the value is there, but you haven't realized it. It's not tangible to you. You haven't touched it. But if you sell your house, you have realized the profits. So on one hand, most of us have houses that have some kind of equity. We have unrealized. When we sell it, we will realize the gains. That is when it's taxable, at least in a brokerage account. All right. Now, where we start to lose a little focus here is what about a dividend? So let's say you bought stock XYZ. It appreciates in value, but you did not sell it. However, throughout the year, maybe each quarter or each month, they paid you a small dividend. The dividend is taxable in the year that you receive it, even if you didn't ask for it and even if you reinvest it. The IRS knows that you were given money that you didn't otherwise previously have, so they want the tax on it. Even if you reinvest your dividends, those are taxable and they will show up on your 1099 for the year. The third thing, if you're going to use margin, I have no problems with that. Understand the rules of the game, right? There's different levels of margin and different brokerage firms even break it down even further. They have different tiers of levels of margin, not to make that any easier, but they do. And they do that because people often sign up for margin without knowing the rules. They just understand they can borrow money. Well, you might have to do a little research. Uh, actually, we did a class for clients where we talked about uh, using cash or Reg T, which is uh, referred to in the, the industry, Reg T, or using um, regular standard margin or using risk-based margin or portfolio margin. There are different levels. There are different rules. So I went over that with our clients. But you want to definitely understand these rules. This is why people hate margin. Now, you shouldn't hate it. For there's no good reason to hate it. You bought a house on margin. If you think about it, we just call it a loan. You understand the rules of the loan. You will maintain your participation in that said property and the bank will in, change, in turn give you some money to buy the property. If you break those rules, the bank has every right to come after you and the property. The same is true for the stock market. If you're going to use margin, then there are rules. You agree to maintain an equity position in that stock. If you do not, or the stock falls and your equity drops as well, well, then the, the lender or the brokerage firm in this case is going to start coming after you. They're going to ask you to put in more money. They're going to ask you to sell the position, whatever it may be, or they'll do it for you. So understand those rules before you do anything. Margin can be a wonderful thing. But if you don't know the rules you're playing with, that's when people get caught. They get what's called margin called. And then I see them posting online that margin sucks. Nobody should ever use that. Um, I disagree, but I would bet you that if we put both of us in a room, I could very quickly figure out you did not know the rules of using margin. Brokerage firms, by the way, will not automatically give you margin. They, and that's by default, right? They want you to know that if you ask for it, they can make an assumption that you understand the rules. You'll still get the whole description and everything, but they want to make sure that if, if, if you don't even know it exists, they're not going to give it to you because that's a whole different ballgame. If you know it exists and you ask for it, they can now document that you've made, they, they made a uh, diligent effort to make sure that you understand what you're doing. Uh, so you can't sue them or anything, right? Again, you use margin on your house. And some of you use it twice. You have a loan and you have a home equity line of credit. You understand the rules of the value of the house. If the value of the house falls, you can be called on that home equity line of credit. Um, not as common as it used to be, but you can. Uh, the final thing I want to talk about is long-term and short-term capital gains. We also just did it. I'm not trying to solicit our classes, by the way, just coincidence, but uh, we did a class for clients breaking this down specifically. There is the retail level of understanding long and short-term capital gains, and maybe you add in tax loss harvesting. There is then the additional level, which we're doing in 2023, right? We're going to ask that additional level of questions uh, with long and short-term capital gains. The gist of it is, um, if you buy stock XYZ 
it goes up in value at some point within a one year period, not a calendar year, one year period from the date that you bought it, um, assuming it's a cash account. Uh, if you sold it and you had a profit, you will be treated as short term capital gains, which is no different than if you went out and earned the money by working a job as far as the IRS is concerned. So you go out to a job, you make so many dollars an hour, whatever it is, they give you a paycheck, you pay taxes on the money that you made. Well, short term capital gains are treated as that same type of income. You says if you went out, your job was to buy a stock, you did well, the stock rewarded you with some money, you sold it within a year, you will pay ordinary capital gains or ordinary income tax on that. That's called short term capital gains. If you are an investor in a particular position, or you forgot about the position, I've got Disney, I've seemed to have had that forever. Uh, so if you bought the stock, I'll use Disney as an example, a year and a day goes by, or even further, two years, five years, whatever it is. And we're going to assume you have a gain on that position. Well, if two years later you sell the position, that's considered an investment and an investment pays or you would pay long term capital gains on that. Now, that can be any number of things. Long term capital gains is a flat tax. Ordinary income is a uh, I'm going to get some flack for this, but it's essentially a progressive tax, right? You don't pay a flat amount on your entire amount of income, although you would technically pay a flat amount on your ordinary gains. It's a separate thing. Um, a flat tax is long term capital gains. Most of you will pay a flat 15% on your gains. So it's really easy to calculate. If I sell this position today and I make $1,000, how much do I get to keep? 850, right? 150 goes to taxes, you keep the rest. So nothing wrong with that. Um, high income earners will pay 20%, but it doesn't go any further than that. You'll never pay more than that on a general stock position. Now there's ways around that by using indices, index options, futures index options. If you're really gung ho about geeking out on this stuff, you can get away with splitting your profit into some short term and some long term, even though you may have sold the position in two days. So there's there's again, I have a feeling we could expand on this class a little bit, but this one's for the beginners. And the only reason I point out some of the advanced stuff is not so that you go, oh my gosh, I got to look look up what he just said, the 60-40 split for using index options. Oh my God, this is crazy. Don't go there, right? Work your way up to that. But understand that there's an extra level there, there's extra layer of things that you can look at. Um, now, lastly, tax loss harvesting. I'm going to make the assumption that when you have your brokerage account and you invest in something that you will likely not invest all your money in one position, maybe in the beginning, but as you grow, you're likely going to say, well, you know, I, I started small. I had, you know, a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, whatever small is to you. I started and I was just excited because I heard about a company that I wanted to invest in. So I had one position. That's fair. But as you add more money in the future, you may say, well, that, I'm happy with that. That's performing. Now I'd like to go invest in this. Well, that's diversifying, right? Tax loss harvesting is the act of selling some of position A and some of position B or C, D, E, F all the way down and doing it in a way where your total reportable realized gain is as close to zero as possible and preferably negative. Even though, let's say you had $10,000 in stock A, $10,000 in stock B, this one went up, this one went down. Even though your account value may have grown, you have a winner and you have a loser. So your account value could be $25,000 because this one had such a big gain, but this position really didn't do anything special and it lost a little bit. Your account value, your unrealized gains are $25,000, but we can sell these in such a way that we show the IRS you lost $500. Bucks. And that's called tax loss harvesting. Um, there are some decent automated tax loss harvesting uh, algorithms out there the, that the big brokerage firms use. They're decent. They don't do so well when you start falling into fractional shares. I know it sounds like they should, uh, but I, I noticed some weaknesses out there that I'm sure will be fixed. But um, you can do better usually if you just take a moment and look at your account and say, if I sell this one and I make $500, but I sell this one and it shows that I lost $450, Okay, now I can have my money back, go invest in something else, and the IRS will think 
that I made a profit of only $50, although you could have a much size, more sizable position there. As your account gets really big and you have lots of positions and you start thinking of it as a portfolio, oh, now there's some real fun you can have there. But today's video is just for the beginners. So I want you to number one know you're taxed on only realized gains. Number two, dividends are definitely taxable in the year that you get them, no matter what you do with them. Number three, if you're going to use margin, take a minute, you know, maybe, maybe 10 and understand how margin works. You'll actually love that you did it. If you really learn how it works, you'll love that you did it because you'll start to see the different advantages you have. Um, and of course the rules of the road. Uh, and number four, um, we have long and short-term capital gains. Understand that before you realize a gain or loss. And then the final thing will be tax loss harvesting. Let that work in your favor to help offset potentially some of your ordinary income. You made $100,000 at your job. You can show on paper you lost $3,000. Guess how much money you made in the eyes of the IRS? $97,000. So that means you don't pay tax on $100,000. You pay it on $97,000. Huge advantages there. Uh, so there you go. It's a good one, right? A little get you going there, throw a little beginner video out. We don't, we don't do beginner videos too often. What do you think? Hmm? And you got to watch your boy drink a hundred dollar bottle of whatever, uh, the Glen Alachi. Not bad. I'm, I'm now persuaded, uh, or motivated by the price. So now it's funny. I drink it and I'm like, you know what? That's not bad. No. Uh, if I had to rank it in terms of a Scotch whiskey, I would rank it up there. But again, I don't have much to compare it to. Um, I'd give that like a whatever a B plus is, maybe like an 80, 87, somewhere in there. Um, if I were eager to spend the money on a bottle, I would definitely come back to this one. Uh, knowing the price, I will likely try some other stuff first, <laughs> right? All right. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks for hanging out with us. And remember at Jazz Wealth, I'm going to use it. I'm going to go with the slogan. We're all family here. Genuinely, we're all family. Um, and uh, we, we really want to be your family's advisor. So hopefully we've uh, taught you, educated you enough along the way that you realize we, we do like to educate. And uh, if you look at our website on the homepage, very quickly, you'll find out there's no strings attached. We don't play games here. Never will. Uh, if we did, you can imagine online and all the comments, there would be lots of people upset at the games that we play. Uh, I just, I can't do it. I just want a straightforward, transparent business. We're not going to be the biggest company ever on the planet, but we do right by enough people as we all age together. We all make some money. All right. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening.